Hello and welcome to another episode of Business Made Simple. I'm your host, Tim Mansour, and my co-host and wife, Crystal Mansour. Thanks for joining us today on Business Radio X, where we are broadcasting live from the Subaru of Gwinnett Studio. Today we're going to be talking about two topics. One is negotiating, which is very important, and another one is something that a lot of you probably don't don't realize, but we're going to be talking about holding a grudge, something that I'd say 95% of us out there are doing, and we're going to talk about why it can hold you back. But let's start with talking about negotiating. Negotiating, what you have to understand in negotiating, every single negotiation is different. So you can't go into the, the negotiation thinking, I'm going to do the same exact thing every time. And it's not always about winning everything when you negotiate. The best negotiating is when two people or two companies get together and make things happen where both of them get a little of something. You might not get everything, but you get some, some part of that negotiation. The biggest thing about negotiation is, number one, is if someone's selling something to you or you're selling something to someone else, how desperate are they? You need to try to find that out. Do your homework. Know what the item that you're buying or selling, what it's worth. Is it, so that when you go into a negotiation, you go into it knowing what the item's worth, what it's worth if you buy it, what it's worth if you sell it. And number two is if you're happy once it's done. You have to know that information before you start negotiating. Uh, number two is seeing is it is this is this house or car or a bicycle or whatever you're buying is it paid in full are these people sitting there saying boy I really need to make this deal how desperate are they or how desperate are you sometimes you have to make a deal because you need you need to make that sale or they need to make it sometimes people do not have to make that sale so that's why I'm saying every negotiation is different I'm gonna tell you something that I think is very important. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this, the movie uh, Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze, a great actor. In this, he was a what they call a cooler. It was pretty much a bouncer. He went into this, this club that was just uh, unbelievable. I mean, they have just tore this place up, and it was all rough. They were tearing this up, that up. And he went in as a cooler and a bouncer, and he got the bouncers together. And I remember what he said. He sat there, and he said, we're going to change this place. We're going to make it different. And the way we're going to do it is if someone acts up, we're going to escort them out, but we're going to do it nicely. That drove these people like, what are you talking about doing something like that nicely? It meant a lot. What you you can do in negotiation is the same exact thing. Be nice. You do not have to be sarcastic or rough or so, so, like you're just so upset. And let me explain why. If you're, negotiating, uh, if you're negotiating with someone, just like if I'm negotiating with you, and I'm nice about it, then you want to make the deal happen. It's, it's, I've done so many deals where I've sat there and said, look, I know what you're asking for this product or, or whatever, but here's why I can only give you this amount. And here's my reasoning. But I understand that it might be worth more to you, but this is all I can do. I hope you understand and we can make this happen. Automatically, people want to make nice people they want to make deals happen. Now, if I went in the other way and I said, hey, look, here's what it's like. I don't care what you think, blah, blah, blah. They automatically, and you would too, will automatically put a wall up thinking, gosh, this person is such a, 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 a mean person. They it, Really, you don't want to make the deal. So I feel like if you can be nice, be firm, do your homework, you can make deals happen so much easier. And we've done that in so many different ways. I've done deals where – Really, it shouldn't have happened, and they actually helped make it happen because I was being nice to them. I respected them. I knew, and I did my homework, so I knew what it was worth, and and people will help you make the deal, but you just don't have to be sarcastic, or you you don't have to be mean to someone to, to make a deal happen. The number, another thing that you got to be careful of is, is dealing with emotions. You cannot, just because you own something, uh, or you've had it a long time or something, you have to understand that it is business. So you, you know, someone might have done their homework and it might be worth $1,000 and you want 1500 or $2,000 for it. You have to understand what is it really worth and once the deal is done, are you happy? That's the most important thing. I'm going to give you an example. Like Crystal and I, let's say we were looking at a car that was worth $30,000. The car, I have checked out the blue book. I know everything about the car. It is a clean car. It's the perfect color. 
perfect timing for Crystal and I to buy a car. And let's just say that they're asking, instead of $30,000, they are asking $3,700. Then I have to make a decision, is it worth $3,700? That's the lowest they will go, will go. So then you start thinking, this is a good time to do it. Do I want to wait longer to, to buy the car? Do I want to do it now? It makes Crystal happy. It makes me happy. So sometimes a negotiation will be where you don't win the lowest bid, but it makes you happy. That's important. So when we walk away and she's happy and I'm happy, then that's it. You don't look back. You make the deal and move on. So sometimes it's not all about getting that bottom dollar. And, you know, you have to look at it and say, Am, is this making us happy today? And that's very important. Uh, I'm also very big on not bluffing. And what I mean by that is, if I tell you something and I say, this is all I can do, then that's all I can do. I don't go back and say, well, this is all I can do. And they make an offer and I say, well, let me negotiate some more. When I put my foot down and say, this is it, then that's it. But you have to live with the consequence. And meaning, I can't walk away and say, well, that was it. But gosh, now I'm not happy it didn't happen. You have to make that decision. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of negotiating and how we've done and just uh, the other day, we bought a home. We actually went and looked at a house. Our realtor called us. We looked at the house Sunday. So we talked to the people. My realtor was so excited to say, look, this house on the courthouse steps would probably bring $180,000. The guy's asking one sixty. If you don't buy it, I'm going to look at maybe doing something myself. I said, well, let me go look at it, which I did. The house was definitely worth one sixty. We knew we'd put about fifty or sixty in it. So we looked at it, talked to him, walked around, kind of figured out some things, told him I'd give him a call. Well, on the way home, we were talking, and I said, you know, I'm going to make this better for him. He had told me that he had signed a contract but was not going to close the deal until Tuesday, and this was on a Sunday, so he did not put any money out yet. He also said the house was full. A lady that lived there was 90 years old, and it was packed full of stuff. It would probably take, you know, if somebody doesn't have connections, three to $5,000 to clean it out, and he was telling me he had to do that. Then he had to close on it. So what I did is I called him back and I said, I'll tell you what I can do. I can't give you 160 but you do not have to touch it. I will have it cleaned out. And the and I think what would really help you is Tuesday when you close at 10 o'clock, and that's when he said he was going to close, what if I'm there and close, buy it from you at 1030? You don't have anything in it. You walk in there, you move away, and I will do that for one forty five five. Now, that's a $15,000 savings for me, but for him, I'm looking at both sides. He buys this property cheaper than I bought it for. He doesn't have to clean it out. He doesn't have to own it. He doesn't have to use his own money. We made the deal happen. So in that way, it worked both ways. We both made something happen. I saved $15,000 and more. I know we'll make money on it. He did well. He held it for a little bit of time. So when you do a negotiation, look at both sides of it. You can't just look at your side because there's two people or two companies involved. So you look at both sides. Another deal that we had done, one of a, a larger deal, we did. Uh, we were looking. Uh, we had a piece of property. It was a land building and equipment. It was a 52,000 square foot building full of equipment. The company that was looking at buying it from us. They were very interested in buying every bit of it from us. So I told them, I said, the best thing to do is let's both get appraisals. Once we get the appraisals, we'll come up with the price and we'll make this thing happen. So anyway, I got my appraisal on the property, and it was somewhere around $6 million. And I was waiting to hear from them, and it's just, this is a long process because of who we were dealing with. So they came back, never would tell me what their appraisal was. But in, really, to be honest with you, that was good news to me because if it was low, they would have told me. So I know that it had to be close to what I, was, I, was, I thought it was. So we're at the numbers of around $5.5 million. We thought we had the deal done. The guy calls me and says, look, we, we think we can make this happen if you'll come meet me in my office. So my brother and I went up to meet him, sat down. We did all the little small talk, and he finally said, look, after looking at everything, I think all we can do, he said, I think, and I heard that think in there, is we can only give you $4.2 million. And, you know, I, then I had to make a decision. Now, I want you to know that at this time we had lost a lot of members because of all the talk that's been going on over almost a year and a half, two years. So we were in a situation we really needed to sell. So I had to make the decision, do I take that, which we could have made it work, or do I just say, no, this is not what I'm going to do? And I decided not to do it. Number one is I never heard him say, this is my last offer. This is all we can do. And I thought, you know, I told him, I said, I think you're wasting both of our times. We have a great appraisal at six, a little under $6 million. I'm not sure what your appraisal was. You never told me. But I know that it's worth $5.5 million. 
Now, when I said that, I did have to understand when I walk away from this deal, if it doesn't happen, I can't beat myself up about it. I have to understand I've made that decision. That's what you need to know. If you walk away, walk away and don't think about it. And we did. My brother almost had a heart attack on the way to our other business. And he said, I just can't believe you walked away from that deal. And I said, well, Joseph, I know he never said that's the final offer. Forty minutes later, he called back and said, we will make this deal for $5.5 million. We closed the deal. They were happy. I was happy. It was worth, I think, on both sides. They're doing very well with it now. And that's just negotiating. That is negotiating nicely. And I did it the best we could. Well, Tim, you gave some great information about about negotiating, but sometimes negotiating is not always about money. When you made the deal and sell to sell the club, um, we were looking at moving four thousand of our members to a new fitness facility. Talk more about those negotiations and what helped you make the final decision with our members uh, once we made that transition and why. Right. And, and again, everything's not about money. We had uh, 4,000 members at that time. We had a lot more. When we had all the clubs. We just had uh, 4,000 at this location. And the uh, college, of course, did not want the members. So we had to have, have a mood. Now, most fitness centers, and if you know any, that close down for any reason, sell their members. I was in a position where I thought, you know, more importantly to me is – to get the members to a location that's as good or better than what they had and paying the same amount. That was so important. So we dealt with two major companies. Both of them are, are all over the country. And we told them, said, look, we're not here to sell these members. I know that sounds crazy. We're here, and we want you to uh, honor exactly what they have. If they paid cash, they get the exact same thing until the time is over. If they're on a monthly payment, they pay those exact monthly payments until the time's over. And that's my most important thing. And, of course, we wanted the club to be large and be kind of like ours was. And ours was 52000 So we made sure that we would give them everything they had. And one of the clubs, and I won't bring it up, just kept going back and forth. Well, we'd rather give you a little bit of money and don't worry about it. We'll take care of the members. Well, I, I, was, I was not going with that because I knew what would happen. They would give me cash and then turn around and start charging my members and then I, that's just not what I was going to do. These members, they were with us for years. We yeah, were in business they were like 30. Family. Yeah, we were in business 30 years. They, these guys were at least 15 years at this location. So we ended up going with Lifetime Fitness. It's a great company. They, Yay. I don't have, yeah, you know, I have nothing but good things to say about them. They took care of my members, and that was the most important thing. And to this day, Crystal still goes over and teaches group fitness and. And we still see a lot of our members. And it, it it didn't make them happy that we were selling, but at least I took care of them, and it made me feel good inside. And that's what matters. You, got, you, you negotiate and you make deals that you feel good with. And that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be happy, but you have to feel good with it, and, that, and that's exactly what we did. Well, visit our website at www.mansour, that's M-A-N-S-O-U-R, International. Dot com where you can catch up on other episodes of our Biz- Business Made Simple podcast. On our website, you can also learn more about us. You can follow our current adventures on flipping homes. You can send us a business question that you might have and that you want to ask. Uh, you can also learn more about a book that we wrote. It is our business journey uh, that we did, and it is titled, It Is Not Impossible, Building a Business from Zero. Our next episode will be on May the 27th, 10 a.m. Don't forget to tune in. We will be talking about flipping homes. It's something that we do now that we enjoy, and we would like to share our step-by-step guide where we have found success in doing this. Uh, It'll be a two-part series episode, uh, so don't forget to tune in on the 27th. Okay, now we're going to be talking about something that probably is going to hit a lot of you Right between the eyes. And the reason I say this is 90% of the people I talk to are holding a grudge. That is just something that we do as human beings. And I think that what we feel is that it makes makes you strong. You're strong if you can hold a grudge longer than the other person holding a grudge. I would say that 95% of you out there right now is holding a grudge. It might be against a family member. It might be a friend, a sister, an aunt, uncle. Uh, whoever it is, you are probably holding a grudge. And you, the way we were brought up is if you hold it long the other person, that you're, you're stronger, and it makes you, makes you um, I guess, stronger or look better. I just want to tell you something. I, I was um, 
that type person. Uh, I played four years of college ball as a linebacker. I ended up leaving there, came and, and started a business. Things were going great. I thought that I could do no wrong. I thought I was Mr. Tough Guy, whatever you want to call it, and how wrong I was. The situation was this. We were brought up in my family. My father was an orphan. His father died when he was five. His mother died when he was six. And he was um, a situation where he went to an orphanage, a Catholic orphanage home, and his goals in life was very simple. He wanted a close family. So there were seven of us, of course, my mother and father and then five of us. I was in the middle. I had an older sister, an older brother, and two younger brothers. And our goal or my, my father and mother's goal was definitely to be have a close family. The money thing was there, I guess, if we were, you know, I say lower income, but that, does, that didn't, you know, Daddy was not – worried about that he wanted a close family and he did that if there's anything that we were we were close we did everything together and what I mean by that is we didn't go out and go all over the place we couldn't afford that but we stayed together we played ball together we watched tv together we ate together and whenever one of us needed the other one we were there I remember a situation with my other brother Paul he was in the air force and even when he was out of the country I would talk to him twice a twice a week one time when he was stationed in Ohio, he called me, and he was having some sit difficulties, and it was a personal matter. The next day I got on the plane, I flew out there and stayed out there three days with him until I knew he was okay. That's just the way we were built. It was just the way that Daddy had us and how he wanted us in life. And the situation that happened here, and this is something that I want you to really think about, is as close as we were, there was one time that I went to Paul, and I said to him, I said, I've got a situation that I want you to – to listen to and talk to me about, but I don't really want anybody else to know about it. And as I talked to him, and this is, again, 22 years ago, I told him this situation, and he felt in his heart, and now I can understand it, that he needed to tell my mother and father, which he did. And it upset me to no means. I mean, I was just mad as I could be. I called him, cussing at him. He's yelling at me, and we're going back and forth because he was as stubborn as I was. We were both stubborn as muse. We thought, who's going to be the toughest? Now, this happened somewhere before, a little maybe or right after Christmas in 96. And we did not talk to each other for 11 months. Now, we went to get-togethers with the family. He'd sit on one side, I'd sit on the other. We would not even look at each other in the eye. Birthdays, we never missed birthdays. We never even talked to each other on our birthdays. Easter, at any time, we never spent time together. Now, this, which really makes me sad, was so tough on my father and my mother. I mean, they were crying. They were begging us to talk to each other, and we were both stubborn as we could be. So we didn't. We did not. We didn't do it. We just would not do it. They called the priest because we're Catholic. They called everybody, and well, they tried every single thing to get us to talk, and we just decided not to. Now, the situation that happened. It was Christmas coming up on, um, and I'll never forget it. We were all in one room, and there was probably ten or twelve of us, and everybody's laughing and talking paul's on one side of the room i'm on the other we in it we hadn't even looked at each other 11 months now and i remember saying something and when i did everybody was laughing it was a joke but paul laughed like i had never heard him he was just like he he was just laughing and i thought man that i hadn't heard that in so long and i turned to him and looked him directly in the eyes and he was across the room from me and i'll never forget it's almost like we didn't say a word to each other we just sat there and looked at each other, and it was almost like we knew what each other were thinking. We were thinking, how could we let 11 months of our life go by and not take care of each other, not be there for each other, for something so silly that I can't even really hardly remember what it was about to this day. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. We both stood up. I couldn't even remember then if anybody was in the room. I know it was full, but I heard nobody but Paul on my mind, and we walked in the middle of the room, and we grabbed each other, and we just sat there and sobbed. I mean, it was almost like, what have we been doing for the last 11 months? It was just unbelievable. And I know my father and them, I felt some people come around us, and I guess it was my mother and father, and everybody was crying. It was just <laughs> unbelievable. This big, tough guy thought I was so tough, and really, you know, I found out the real, the real me. And I looked at him, and after talking for hours and hours, we spent until early in the morning just catching up. I told him and I told the rest of my family, I said, I can tell you one thing. There might be a lot of things that happen in our life, and I might be upset at you and you might be upset at me, but I can promise you one thing. I will not 
ever hold a grudge again against any of you. And to be honest with you, I'm not going to hold a grudge to anybody. It's not worth it. And what I mean by that is people out there, is it worth, is somebody so important that you hold a grudge to have hatred in your heart? And you might not think it's hurting you, but I can tell you it will hold you back. It is just unbelievable how many people are doing that, thinking that it's the right thing to do. And um, I remember in that January, Paul and I flew to uh, Alabama. We did a small hunt together. He has a small little Cessna plane, had a great time. We went back to the normal way. We were together. We talked and just spent time together. It was just unbelievable. He um, was in the Air Force, of course, and in uh, March the 14th, he um, was flying to North Carolina to see my mother and father. It was a time that uh, they were going to do a little get-together, and uh, I didn't go. And him and Connie, which was his ex-girlfriend, flew flying in that evening, crashed the plane, and it killed him. And um, so... Yeah, I knew Paul. He was such a funny guy and he was such a um loving guy and he was so like your father as well i mean he loved family and yep. it is amazing how close all of you were not just one or two of you so it was amazing you were all so tightly knit it was it was it, amazing it was unreal so anyway i guess i wonder to this day if we wouldn't have made up you know how how i would be living today you know and i just thank god that we did i know he's in heaven now with my father and um i just i guess what i'm saying to you today and a lot of you are out there that are listening you know what i'm talking about is it really worth it if that person passed or if that person something happened to him was it did it mean that much to hold that grudge and i just think if you really think about it i've lived 22 years with no grudges now i want to say this i want you to understand that doesn't mean that I'm going to hang around every person in this world that I don't believe in. There's some people that I will not do business with or I will not hang around, but I can tell you I have no hatred in my heart for them. And that's so important, not just in business but in life, because it will hold you back no matter what you think. I also want to say is if you pick the phone up now and you call that person that's holding a grudge and they're mad at you, that's their decision. Let them be mad. There's a lot of people out there that does not like Tim Mansour, that's their decision, and if that's what they want to hold, that's up to them. I'm not going to do it, and it has been the best thing that ever happened to me in my life, and that's why it's so passionate that I wanted to talk to you about it today. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you enjoyed the show today. If this is your first time tuning in or if you have subscribed to this podcast, we broadcast the second and fourth Wednesday each month. You can also visit our website at www.mansourinternational.com for more episodes of Business Made Simple. You can also send us your business questions, so we want you to be a part of the show. Remember to hit the subscribe bus button for this podcast, uh, so you can li- or you can listen live here on Business Radio X or your favorite podcast app. Our next Business Made Simple episode, again, is on May the 27th at 10 a.m., where we look forward to talking to you again. And until then, watch watch what what you wish for. for. It It might might come come true. true.